you know the old saying that you know the cure for higher oil prices is high oil prices because when they get too high people stop driving right now we do not have demand pull inflation we do have cost push inflation yep. we had a recession and prices collapsed I have an introduction uh, where I talk about a Bronze Age vessel, a wreck in a place called Ulu Burun, which is off the southern coast of Turkey, that was discovered by a sponge diver in the 1980s, and then it was it was excavated. It was the most perfectly preserved Bronze Age cargo they've ever discovered. But what was in it, and I have the inventory list and a lot of research on it, there was uh, amber from uh, the vicinity of the Baltic Sea. There was gold, which came, at the time came from Sudan. There were swords, which at the time came from you know, Damascus or, or you know, present-day uh, Israel and Lebanon. Um, you know, there was oil from uh, from uh, olive oil from from Italy, etc. There was a carving for, of uh, Queen Nefertiti, which was bound for her in Alexandria, Egypt. The point being, uh, this vessel had a was doing a, a counterclockwise um, a circuit of the Mediterranean Sea. You know, based on the winds, picking up and dropping off cargo all along the way. But that supply chain, if you go from, you know, like Sweden to Sudan, it's almost the Arctic Circle to the equator, and from present day Iran to Spain, that's 5 million square miles. So there's nothing new about supply chains. We can document to the Bronze Age. What was new beginning around 1989 was supply chain science. The combination of vastly improved computing power, artificial intelligence, new algorithms, and more sources of data that could be put together and used by experts to to optimize and make the supply chains more efficient. That was new. And it kind of began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, you know, Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Soviet Union uh, uh, dissolved uh, in 1991. I talked to the guy who, you know, like this is a worldwide endeavor, but he was probably the single most responsible individual for all the significant developments in the supply chain in the last 30 years. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. We blew it up in three years. It's not going to come back overnight. It's going to take 10 years or more to rebuild it. And what I talk about in the book is supply chain 1.0, which is 1989 to 2019. And then supply chain 2.0, which kind of starts now but it's going to go indefinitely because it's going to take a long time to put this together. It's, uh, you know, it's like dropping a vase and it breaks in a, a thousand pieces. You can't put it back together. You got to go buy a new vase. And that's what's going on with the supply chain. The, there will be a supply chain. There always is. But the new supply chain will look very different from what we've just come through. Because the whole the whole 30 years of period I'm describing was built on efficiency. You know, like lower cost, lower cost, lower cost. It was kind of the Walmart model. So yeah, just in time inventory, everyone knows about that. But there's something called cross docking. That's where a truck pulls up at a warehouse and you unload it. And instead of putting the stuff in the warehouse, you move it to another truck that then goes to a destination. The stuff never goes in the warehouse. Inventories are very expensive. They're they're they're, they're costly to finance. You got to move the stuff around. It's called picking. You know, pick the stuff off the shelf with your. I used to drive a forklift, so I know a little bit about it. Uh, you know, and put it on a truck. Used to unload trucks too. Um, but um, so so, you know, hey, I've got seven suppliers. Why don't I cut it down to three and do bigger contracts with each one and get lower unit costs? I've got five transportation lanes. Why don't I cut that down to two? get everything to you know, Los Angeles and Seattle, as the case may be, you know, et cetera. And they, they did it for three, and they got cost lower, you know, and, and Walmart and Amazon were the champions of this, but everyone else was doing it, but they missed something. What they missed was that they're, while they were getting those unit, unit costs lower for consumers, they, there were hidden costs. And the main hidden cost was you, you were creating greater frailty. This whole system was subject to a massive, massive breakdown. So, uh, you know, what happens if you have two suppliers and they both go on strike? What happens if you have one port of entry and it's backlogged? What happens if, um, uh, you know, you, you, you've you got uh, quest docking in warehouses and there aren't enough trucks? There's 80, there are 80,000, we need 80,000 drivers, 80,000 drivers. I wish they'd hire them instead of these IRS agents. But the point being, um, it, it is breaking down all across the board. Now, will it, it can it be put back together? Yes, but the biggest difference between 2.0 and 1.0, um, this goes by different names. Uh, 
you know, Johnny Allen called it friendshoring and Macron called it a constellation of nations. Uh, I, I use the term a college of nations, you know, collegial club, if you will. So you'll still have trading partners, you'll still have outsourcing, you'll still have transportation lanes, but it'll be members only. It'll be basically democratic, kind of liberal republics, Western Europe, uh, you know, the EU, of course, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, you know, and, and some others, India, we expect to be included, Fr friendly nations, but China's out. We're decoupling from them. They're decoupling from us. This isn't US driven. The US is participating, but this is what China wants too. Both sides are decoupling as fast as they can. China can develop its own network, you know, maybe Central Asian Republic, some Southeast Asian um, you know, suppliers and so forth, but they're going to lose customers. Well, most of their customers actually in, in the United States, we won't buy their stuff <clears throat> and we won't sell them our stuff, particularly high tech stuff. So you, the world's going to break and, and these new clubs are going to be formed and there will be trade and there will be transportation lanes, but it'll be much more restrictive. Now, will prices be a little higher? Yes, but it'll be more secure. So the way I describe that, you know, if you buy uh, insurance on your house or I buy insurance on my house, you don't want your house to burn down. You hope it doesn't. But if it does, you don't think your insurance premium to a waste of money. Like when you write that check, you're like, that's money well spent. When you pay higher prices for consumer goods, the, the delta between the old price and the new price is your insurance premium for a more reliable system. And also, there's a big national security component to this. And I talk about Russia and Ukraine and China in the book. So that's all, uh, so so what the supply chain breakdown means, chapter one, chapter two, what caused it? And we talked to, about that. And three, where is it going? Uh, what are the constraints? And we talked about that. But then my editor, who's love working with us, she said, well, Jim, got to be a chapter on inflation. I said, of course we do. You know, the supply chain breakdown is causing a lot of the inflation we see. And we agreed on that. And then I said, I'm, and I'm going to write another chapter on deflation. And everyone's like, wait a second, why are you talking about deflation? That's coming next. People are not ready for it. I know the inflation's here. I buy gasoline. I, I shop in the grocery store. I get it. I'm not, it it's, and it's persistent. It's not transitory. I understand all that. But inflation has two major sources. One is the supply side, which is called cost push inflation. So that's energy price shocks, you know, the stuff we're seeing coming out of Ukraine, fertilizer shortages, strategic metal shortages, um, uh, you know, component suppliers who can't deliver stuff to factories in Germany and they're shutting down, et cetera. The other cause is from the demand side, and that's called demand pull inflation, basically psychological. Consumers pull demand forward. They're like, hey, I was thinking of buying a refrigerator. I better buy it today because the price is going to go up in six months. And the 70s, we had both. It started with cost push with the Arab oil embargo, but it ended up demand pull. Um, I was starting my career at the time. They, Your boss would just give you a raise. You didn't even have to ask. You know, inflation was going up so fast, like I better get this guy a raise. It gives another, you know, 30,000 bucks or whatever, because people would quit, you know? And uh, and that and that sort of spun out of control until Volcker squashed it all. Right now, we do not have uh, demand pull inflation. We don't. This is not what's going on. We do have cost push inflation. The difference is, is hugely important because cost push inflation from the supply side, which is again, when I talk about in the book, it's real, prices go up, but uh, it's self negating. You know, the old saying that, you know, the cure for higher oil prices is high oil prices because when they get too high, people stop driving. They, they shut down um, various activities. By the way, if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gasoline because you're not going anywhere. I mean, that's, that's kind of a nasty way of putting it, but that's that's how cost push inflation, <clears throat> pardon me, tips into a recession and then prices come down. And we saw that in 1974, you know, you had Jerry Ford and Alan Greenspan walking around with their, they had these win buttons, you know, W-I-N, was super whip inflation now, except we had a recession and prices collapsed. Uh, now it came back uh, by 77 with, uh, for, for a lot of reasons, but but right now we don't have demand pull, we have cost push. It will go away when this economy goes into recession. And then we're gonna be talking about um, disinflation and deflation, which are, you know, kind of close cousins. And the Fed's gonna be out on a limb as usual, raising rates in the face of a, a recession and a price collapse. Mm -hmm.